I'm Ram. I go by Ram. It's easy. Uh, I lead the security architecture team here at uh, Garden Health. Um, I'm not as active on Twitter as uh, other people are, but uh, that's my primary channel to receive uh, any information about security. Uh, that's my go-to place right now. Um, and you can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, just a quick recap on the, uh, on the Zero Trust, just like John uh, talked about. Uh, I come from a software development background building applications moved into security. Uh, so my approach to Zero Trust is about, let's look at this from an architecture perspective. Let's look at uh, what, what exists, what controls we have, instead of going for a, a new solution or a new vendor. Uh, and, and every vendor has the Zero Trust name attached to it, uh, which kind of makes your head spin. I was like, I don't know which one is uh, uh, we, we trust, which one we cannot trust. Uh, uh, today we'll talk do a quick recap about what the uh, zero trust architecture is. Um, how do we look at the complexities of identity, device, and network? Um, proxy architecture is uh, as old as uh, I am, or, or as old as anybody else here. Uh, and there are point solutions that the vendor brings to the market. Uh, there is not a dig at any vendor, but there are multiple point solutions available. So what which solution helps? Uh, one team versus another, or one customer, uh, one company versus other people. How do we connect the dots? How do we build difference in depth security using uh, the technology we already have or the solutions you might be buying uh, for addressing a specific set of problems? Um, I want to get this uh, conversation started with the with the uh, the go to zero trust slide from CISA. Uh, I have the reference uh, list on the uh, towards the end of the slide. Uh, if you look at this, it's there. There are the few pillars of this, which uh, identity, identity, like everyone says, uh, that's the new perimeter. Uh, we have single sign-on. We still have username and password. We have passwordless authentication, uh, and and it goes on. So and the devices, uh, endpoints, whether you're doing beyond CARP or beyond Prod uh, reference architecture from Google, uh, you can look at it from uh, your user laptops and endpoints, or you can also look at it from uh, software and services running on your network, your uh, virtual machines to uh, anything else. Um, the network or the environment, um, the Zero Trust is in, uh, it's, it's not a bolt-on solution. It needs to fit into your uh, your network and your environment. And every network and every environment is, is different. Uh, there's legacy aspects to it. The newer companies are built on top of the cloud infrastructure. Um, so, as we go uh, into this, you, you have the network and then the application workloads. Um, as you break it down, uh, your uh, your network, your environment, you will see various types of applications, commercial applications uh, that you're buying and installing versus custom homegrown applications. It can be product, it can be uh, productivity application. And at the end of the day, it's data, data is a new oil. Uh, you are looking at how do we protect the data uh, that is important to you, your organization, uh, and all of them connects together with visibility. Uh, while as much as we want to uh, build controls over every single layer, uh, we need visibility uh, to uh, make sure that we have proper uh, preventions in place. Uh, automation is the only way we can scale, even the General metrics is about 1% of your employee staff is security. And some organizations are less than that, some are more than that. But um, automation is the only way uh, well, we can scale uh, things. Uh, governance helps uh, making sure people are uh, understanding what they're building, what their risk is. So this, these are all the different areas we will be covering and how it impacts uh, our architecture. So as we go into zero trust, it's defense in depth. And at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is um, we only want to allow access to authorized users. We only want to allow them from the trusted devices uh, or from trusted locations. If you're a geographically distributed uh, uh, company, uh, users from the various locations, well, which ones are approved, which ones are not approved, authorized, unauthorized. Uh, and at the end of the day, those are access granted to a resource. Resources, your applications, your SSH, RDP, web applications, API, whatever you want to call it. So those are your resources. Uh, and with all kinds of controls we want to put, uh, authentication, strong, uh, strong authentication or MFA, 
uh, fine grain access control and everything else, we still need to have visibility and monitoring to make sure that only the right users are doing the right things. And I want to get a little bit more uh, theoretical uh, aspects out of the way. And as you, uh, if you read any uh, zero trust architecture, you will get or stumble upon the East concept, which is called uh, PDP and PUP. Uh, policy uh, definition points, policy enforcement points. These, um, I can recall this came up around uh, when ZACML as the fine grain authorization was being built uh, some, somewhere between 2001 uh, to 2004 timeframe, uh, where we can build all kinds of authorizations uh, in an uh, expressible by XML and have different applications understand what the policies are and they can enforce it in a unified way. Uh, it didn't pick up as much as uh, everyone wanted to. Uh, it was uh, very complex, uh, but the concepts are pretty much the same. Uh, and that's what is being a, a reference in multiple zero trust architecture documents. Uh, so policy uh, definition points are your policy engines. So it can be a point solution. It can be your VPN where you can say, well, I need users, but username and password plus certificate plus MFA to allow access. Uh, I'm going to block uh, from certain IP ranges. So those are your policies that you are defining uh, that fits in your uh, organization, addressing your risk. Um, those are your policy administrators that are configuring those policies. Those policies are usually to protect uh, the data or the resource, and you're leveraging the identity and access management. You're looking at the, uh, the analytics coming from uh, the logs, uh, UBA, or any type of uh, custom uh, analytics you're, you're looking into. Uh, and then you can say, well, this is only can be accessed from my corporate device versus a BYOD device. So uh, it can be a, any N number of combinations. So that's what the policy definitions are about. How do we configure the policies uh, in a way we want to protect the, um, the resource uh, and grant access to the uh, authorized users from authorized location. Policy enforcement points, um, if you're looking at the uh, zero trust, you, you see uh, vendors calling it sassy, but it's basically pushing it to the edge uh, to make the enforcement. Uh, if you're looking at a web application, for, for example, uh, your web app having its own access control, or if your web app is proxied through another front end and the proxy is the one that is doing the enforcement. Um, so policy enforcement points are where, uh, how do we enforce the policies that are defined? Uh, it can be a centralized policy engine defining it and pushing it to all the policy enforcement points, or you, in, some, in some cases, both of them are just acting as one single uh, point solution. Uh, so uh, policy definition, policy enforcement are uh, uh, at a high level blocks that are, one is defining the policy, the other one is uh, enforcing uh, what the policy dictates as supposed to be happening. Identity. Uh, I started my career into security uh, in kind of two different ways. One is on the encryption. Uh, the other one is on the identity. Identity is where I kind of moved from being a software development to uh, fully focusing on security. So, uh, so it's kind of bread and butter to me. But I'm, in this talk, I'm going to focus more on uh, what is an identity, how complex it is. And I'm only sharing a few elements of it. Uh, when we talk about identity from a corporate standpoint, uh, identity and access management, we have the uh, traditional users, which are employees and contractors that are hired through uh, your HR system. Uh, and, and they are, you go through the normal uh, hiring uh, termination process, they are here, and, and that's how it gets started. But then there is this uh, uh, different use cases where we end up working with various business partners, consulting organizations, third parties, this one is much more familiar with everybody in this group here, which is pen testers. Uh, if you as an organization go hire a pen testing uh, vendor, uh, they show up, they don't get onboarded onto your HR system as a contractor. You don't know who is going to be working on your uh, particular pen test that week. Uh, and we just give them uh, access in some way. Uh, but how do we keep track of who should be accessing, who, who are the different partners and consulting organizations we work with? Some can be an outsourced vendor monitoring certain types of your applications. And then uh, as you go into, okay, now I want you to enforce the authentication. I want to look at the identity providers. 
you have the traditional username and password, right? So if you have a web application, uh, SaaS application, uh, that are exposed to your users. And most of the time, uh, it, it starts with a username and password. Um, there is a website that, that tracks about the SSO tax, which all the vendors charge about uh, for uh, adding single sign-on features. If you don't have them, then you, you are going through a username and password a mechanism. But if you are lucky enough to bring them onto a, a, a federated single sign-on, uh, it goes into your single sign-on instance. And even within a single sign-on instance, with or without single sign-on instance, depending on the nature of the application, uh, you can leverage multiple form factors, username and password, um, your biometrics uh, on your Mac and Windows, uh, YubiKey type of thing. Uh, you can uh, add in a second factor authentication. Uh, it can go from secret question and answer to um, uh, stronger authentication factors. Uh, so this complexity varies. Now, if you if you were to go back and think about how do I do um, the policy definition, policy enforcement in the context of identity, you cannot just say, well, I have an identity and access management, but a critical application that you want to protect, you want to say, um, this has to come through uh, a single sign-on interface and has to have a multi-factor authentication that is um, a phishing proof and anything else. So that's where the identity complexity grows. Now let's look at the devices and the users. We talked about employees, contractors, uh, business partners, and everybody. So in this case would be, uh, you have managed devices from the corporate or a corporate issue where you can install the EDR agents and any other agents you want. Uh, and you have the unmanaged device, the business partners, consulting, BYOD type. Uh, but all of them are going to be accessing your applications, uh, depending on the controls you have defined. Uh, they get to access everything or they get to access a subset of them. Uh, we also have this use case where a managed device that may be infected with the malware uh, or running a legacy operating system that could be potentially causing issues down the road. Uh, how do we uh, worry about this? Uh, like the previous panel talked about, security people are get paid to worry about, uh, right? So we can constantly worry about all of this. So. And at the end of the day, the devices plus users are accessing your environment, your network, your application. The network is uh, your traditional office sites, uh, your traditional data centers, virtual data centers you have, um, or um, you have SaaS uh, applications that people go to access, uh, which can bypass your internal controls might, might be available. And then the cloud environments where uh, your DevOps team, SRE team can uh, uh, spin up a bunch of resources and be accessible from uh, anywhere you want. Now let's put all of these three together. So you have the user, you have the device, and you have the network. So which user is allowed to access what applications in your network from what device? So that's, that's where we'll prove because you want to know my trusted employees and contractors or the trusted business partners coming through specific channel of identity and access from a device that you can either uh, monitor or uh, to say, well, this is a device. If you take actions on this, I can monitor. I have the EDR agent, I have the DLP agent, I have something else. Uh, then you can then force them through uh, some type of a policy enforcement to say, now you get to access these SaaS applications or infrastructure and internal applications. That's the uh, combination we have. At the end of the day, these are done to gain access to your applications and data, which are uh, called generally called resources. Uh, but then each resource has its own access control list, right? Who can access what? Your web application gets to decide who are the authorized user. Your SaaS application, even though it's integrated with single sign-on, it has its own access control list. Um, and single sign-on application will only grant access. Not everyone uh, does provisioning and uh, scheme integration. Uh, and then it's down to the stakeholder, the business uh, business owner to say who's allowed to access what application, what can they do in the, within that uh, application. Then you have the combination of user device and uh, location. Um, and then you have the, whether you want to enforce this at the edge, whether you want to enforce this uh, at the network layer. So where do you want to do? So you want to fail fast, you want to enforce at the edge but you want to have consistency uh, and avoid any type of lateral movement. You want to have the policies pushed down to uh, your um, 
network devices. So you can enforce uh, not only granting access to an SSH to a box, it's also enforcing that there's no lateral movement for that user plus other combinations. So to uh, kind of put a pictorial overview of this, you the various permutation combination is uh, different types of users, employees and consultants, contractors, uh, coming from different types of devices, managed and unmanaged, and even the managed device devices that doesn't meet your criteria. Uh, and then it goes into what type of network access they can give and gain access to, what type of uh, resources they can access. And then you still want to support the business. That means you want your vendor partners to access certain application, but then you want them to go through uh, some type of a VDI jump host type of environment so that you can have better monitoring in place. So the complexity grows uh, with every uh, uh, flavor of application, every flavor of network deployment, every flavor of device, device ownership and the users uh, we bring in. Uh, so the reality, this is the magic one. The magic one I'm talking about is there's no one single solution you can go and then say, well, if I buy this and bolt on, it'll work. It, it, I have not seen this. I'm happy to uh, take notes. Uh, will make my life easier at least. Um, the reality is, uh, it is it's a complex environment. Whether no matter how small or medium or big your enterprise is, uh, uh, there is always various flavors of this, various policies, various exceptions that one has to deal with. Uh, and then you can attach things like data uh, data loss prevention, uh, data leakage. How do you track the data leaving your network through these various channels? Uh, uh, and how do you monitor them uh, that whether they are doing it through the right uh, channels or not? Uh, so, so the magic one would be is the as a, we would as much as we we think we don't we don't have a magic one, but the thing is let's go buy a single point solution, uh, what uh, or a proxy solution, or should we just step back and then look at it as a system, um, as as a system of system. So proxies are pretty old. I don't know if anyone remembers a product called Novel Access Manager. So that's, I try not to be uh, speaking about vendors, but that was my first introduction to single sign-on back uh, when the company I was working for got acquired by Novel. And one of their product uh, along with eDirectory was Access Manager. Back in the day when every other vendor was doing single sign-on through an agent-based approach, uh, uh, having agents on your web servers that will intercept your traffic, force the policies and everything else. Uh, this was the only vendor at that time was doing a proxy-based solution. And that's exactly what it is today with some of the zero trust solution is the proxy is just moved to the cloud. You spin up, you have an agent somewhere sitting on your network. It proxies the traffic, sends them over. That's for your web publication. You have similar proxy op options, um, whether you go through a PAM solution or anything else, uh, the, the SSH terminal access through browser. Uh, and, and these are all the different flavors of the proxy solution that lets you gain access to various resources through um, through one choke point. Uh, so so proxies can, and I'm not saying that proxies are a bad idea. Uh, what I'm saying is proxies does serve a purpose. It gives you uh, a unified way to enforce uh, your policies, security policies at, at the proxy layer. A proxy can be your web application single sign-on layer. It can be exposing your internal application to the uh, to the internet without connecting to the VPN. Uh, it can be going through your, uh, accessing your SSH and RDPs through a, a single uh, interface. Um, so that's what it's for. It expedites your uh, zero trust adoption or defense in depth or enforcing policies or even having a visibility in one place. Uh, but it has its own uh, challenges, right? One is, um, Every time you have you pick a service or an endpoint or a resource and you want to expose it on the proxy, you need to put go through the change ticket and have take the resource, apply them into your product of choice and make it available uh, on the uh, on the proxy layer. So it's not uh, it's not like easy. It works by itself. Um, well, some some vendors some, some tools uh, makes it uh, slightly uh, easier to do. But you still have to go through to uh, contain the, the security policies, access control, who can do what. Um, so that's where the, it has its own challenges on the proxy. Point solutions are, uh, you, you're, it, it's basically a flavor of a proxy where I'm, I'm looking at a specific problem, whether it is uh, a, 
uh, whether it is just controlling my SSH access or controlling access to the database, it's controlling just the APIs. Um, so however you want to define it, uh, you you go through a point solution that says, uh, I will enforce the device trust only uh, corporate device devices or devices that you trust can gain access to uh, XYZ resource. So that's one, one point solution. If you're all your web application single sign on proxies are all another point solution that just tells you uh, how to enforce the authorization in one place. So uh, as this goes through, there is no one magic one that we can wave and then say, well, let's buy this product or a solution, uh, spin this up and it will solve all the problems. So you still have to work with your stakeholders, work with your application teams, work with your resource owners uh, and define the security policies and make sure that uh, all the elements fit. And then also work with the, your, your operations teams to make sure that they are uh, they can monitor, they have visibility into it. So, but if you step back, if you're going to do all of them, all we're doing is we are applying defense in depth. We are looking at system of systems and we're coming up with ways to secure this the system. Uh, we are trying to introduce barriers uh, in various forms, whether it is at the VPN or VPN less uh, or at the proxy layer or whatever. Uh, and then at the end of the day, to give a full visibility into all of them, your user types, different users, uh, different device types, different types of authentication, different resources, different locations. You, you have to integrate all the status from various uh, uh, endpoints to say, where, how do I make sense out of this? Is this a valid user versus not valid user type? So I want to kind of look for a couple of minutes, step away from security and talk about a general system architecture for a, uh, shopping cart application type of thing or any e-commerce application, right? Which is everybody knows, you, you, you go to your favorite app, uh, you can place an order. Um, my first job in this country was uh, at Priceline.com. If, if you remember, you can go in and submit your ticket, name your price, and it happens. And about 80% of the architecture that I have defined here closely resembles what we were doing 20 years ago. Uh, so you you go into a web application of choice based on your scalability need. Uh, when you when you go and look for an inventory, the inventory doesn't happen uh, automatically. Uh, it comes from its own microservice. It comes from its own database. But then they were integrating them through some kind of a, a queuing system, messaging system, um, enterprise service bus, uh, simple queue service, or any uh, any one of those flavors of them. Uh, and then on the back end, you have another system that says, "I'm a seller. I want to." go bring this new system, I want to sell this, uh, it goes into the inventory, it gets added to the queue, it gets uh, appears on their website. Same flow happens again. When you go place the order, uh, it goes through an order processing system. Uh, you're at the, at the same time, when you're placing the order, you're also uh, making the payment. Uh, when you make the payment, depending on the country, depending on other regulations, sometimes they don't charge you until they ship. Sometimes they charge before or put a hold on it. Um, so uh, it, it gets processed uh, in, a, in a slightly different way, but then they want to make sure that the credit card has been charged, payment has been taken, and then the order gets released and then it gets shipped. It's sent to the shipping. Shipping is its own workflow. So I did, uh, I never worked for a shopping company, but this is a, my own makeup, made up architecture here. Um, so don't ask me any questions on the validity of this architecture. Um, so, uh, so the shipping its own uh, umbrella, it goes to the shipping company, it goes to the inventory. So at the end of the day, it's it's a system uh, that you have to look at it as an end-to-end -end system. How do I build a shopping application? How is it easy to go and place an order? And then the the your whatever you ordered appears at your door the next day, right? Now, if you take the similar system thinking without looking at a specific product or anything in mind, without looking at a point solution, without looking at uh, any of them and say, okay, how do I, uh, protect our enterprise uh, coming for the users coming from various types of devices, managed and unmanaged, various types of users. Uh, how do I do it? You, the normal thing is if you have a device, the device might be infected. You can get a, uh, your EDR can send you an alert and you can triage it through whatever mechanism you want. And then the moment it meets, it passes your threshold of, uh, uh, of the infected score you want to do, you can then send it to say, okay, I want to quarantine this machine or 
lower the access profile. So if someone has access to administrative privileges, you want to bring them down to one level down, or if someone has access to um, critical resources, you want to completely quarantine, move them off of your network as soon as possible. So it can be done through similar way. You send a message to a queue, it gets processed, it applies the policy, policy goes back to this, uh, this set of the automation, which is applying the policy, pushing it to the endpoint. So now if the same user comes in through uh, your VPN, VPN gateway, whatever it is, the policy gets uh, enforced the same way. So now as the user comes through your identity layer, assuming it's a single uh, identity choke point versus, or multiple choke points, um, you have the UB equivalent. You can say, oh, the user is allowed to come in from uh, XYZ country or not. And you can have those alerts and you can prioritize. Um, multiple failed login or any any kind of uh, threshold that you have set, if it meets or exceeds those threshold, you can then say, well, I'm going to have to either review or deny access to that user. Uh, so this is one way of thinking this uh, approach. So think of this as mostly as integration, right? Uh, if you want to block end, endpoint devices from uh, because it's a legacy operating system, uh, we should be able to do it. Or if it's an infected device with a malware, you want to be removed from the VPN, removed from your corporate network, you can do it. Uh, Wi-Fi, we all know one set, which is usually, generally people start with saying, I have a guest Wi-Fi, I have a corporate Wi-Fi, but once you're on the corporate Wi-Fi, you generally have access to uh, uh, everything on the network. How do I, uh, kind of, uh, the, the different flavors of the example of this. If you want to remove the legacy uh, uh, operating system from your network, it doesn't necessarily have to be a new tool. You have your managed device. It's some kind of a tool that is managing all the endpoints. Uh, you have some level of asset inventory, whether whatever your tool of choice, we can query them to understand, okay, what are all the different operating systems available? Which ones are outdated? And a, a simple message to a queue that says, here is the host name, serial number, and put them in a specific quarantine policy. And now they only have access to uh, they don't have access to VPN or they only have access to certain SaaS application, ticketing system, whatever it is. So this is one way of uh, solving the problem. Uh, same thing, you can take an infected device and then say, well, it meets my criteria uh, uh, that it's a zero day malware, whatever it is, and you want to remove them from the network as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, every EDR agent now supports API it's easy to uh, integrate them into your uh, network device to say, uh, remove this device or deny access to this. It can even be done at your identity layer to say, now for this um, type of resources, deny access because the machine is uh, infected. Uh, Wi-Fi segmentation, like if you are using any type of Azure Trust product, uh, you can tell send, if you're doing this for users working from home or their uh, much more risky than being on the carpet. You can do the same thing by a device goes through your um, carpet Wi-Fi and instead of giving them access to everything, uh, they can be sent through the same uh, zero trust proxy solution and it enforces the similar policies that are set for the user device uh, and, and the resource and, and then they can be granted access to those um, uh, just on a need basis, whatever application that they need access. So becoming quick on time, hopefully we'll be quick. Um, in, the, in the example we've done without talking about a specific product and most products today support some level of API integration, uh, we are able to uh, remove a legacy device from the network. We are also able to remove uh, infected device from the network, uh, architecturally move all the traffic from your corporate Wi-Fi as well as working from home traffic, remote traffic through the same uh, ZTNA type of solution that are that are available so that you have consistent policy. Um, and think if you think in terms of system, then you can now approach it as a software design principle to say, how do I take various uh, scores or uh, telemetry coming from uh, uh, various services, whether it is your identity and access management saying, uh, this user is uh, attempting multiple fail login to a device that um, infected to, uh, to any other uh, parameter, you can think in terms of system, I'm going to send this all to a, a set of uh, asynchronous processing uh, or even, uh, and some type of API integration. And then it goes 
uh, it, it gets reused. So you, you define the policy one, you define your system once, and then it gets integrated. Um, my quick notes on the zero trust is start anywhere. Don't, don't have to look for a magic solution. Don't look for a, a specific product. It's a journey. It's not a one solution that will solve all the problem. Uh, whatever vendor that is solving today's problem, you will soon be uh, reaching the capacity um, six months, a year or two from now. Main thing is understand your stakeholders, understand your current stack capabilities and see if they can provide uh, any type of uh, API integration. Uh, so that way you're not logged into one vendor supporting uh, a set of X or Z vendors for integration that, that might solve your today's problem, but then tomorrow when you move your EDR to another EDR solution, it might not work. Um, look at it as a roadmap. You can have your one year, three year roadmap or however you want. And look at various uh, elements of it and see what is at risk and every risk for your company your environment is different. Uh, so whether you want to focus more on device trust versus identity versus uh, continuous monitoring, however you want to start, you can start anywhere, but have a roadmap to say, here is my maturity. And CISA already has a, there are a couple of maturity models you can track. Uh, but then you're going to be looking at fine tuning the policies as you go through, as you look at your risk and look at the data, look at the data to say, okay, is this policy good enough or do you want to fine tune more? or you want to relax it based on what you're seeing. A um, few re uh, references, uh, it, 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 zero trace is pretty uh, known concept, uh, but there are very good information available uh, and that you can spend all day. Uh, there's a UK web website as well that you can also spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, thank you.